Welcome back, listeners, to Sandman Stories Presents, a folklore podcast where I read you to sleep or until the next story. I'm your host, Dustin. Today we are back in the translation of the Panchatantra by Arthur Ryder. We're reading Chapter 10, Numskull and the Rabbit. In the previous story, Victor told the story of a bird that killed a snake and of a crab that killed the stork, in order to tell them how to separate Rusty the lion and Lively the bull. In this chapter, Cheek and Victor will talk about deceit and try to convince Rusty that Lively plans to do him wrong. Okay, let's begin. Chapter 10 Numskull and the Rabbit In a part of the forest was a lion, drunk with pride, and his name was Numskull. He slaughtered the animals without ceasing. If he saw an animal, he could not spare him. So all the natives of the forest, deers, boars, buffalo, wild oxen, rabbits, and others, came together and with the woebegone countenances, bowed heads and knees clinging to the ground, they undertook to beseech obsequiously the king of the beasts. Please stop, O king, with this merciless, meaningless slaughter of all creatures. It is hostile to happiness in the world, for the scripture says, A thousand future lives will pass in wretchedness, for sins of fool commits his present life to bless. Again, what wisdom in a deed that brings dishonor fell, that causes loss of trust, that paves the way to hell. And yet again, the ungrateful body, frail and rank with filth within, is such that only fools for its sake sink in sin. Consider these facts and cease, we pray, to slaughter our generations. For if the master will remain at home, we will on our own send for him his daily food, one animal of the forest. In this way, neither the royal sustenance nor our families will be cut short. In this way, let the king's duty be performed. For the proverb says, The king who tastes his kingdom like elixir, bit by bit, who does not overtax its life, will fully relish it. The king who madly butchers men, their lives as little reckoned as lives of goats has one square meal, but never has a second. A king desiring profit guards his world from evil chance, with gifts and honors waters it as florists water plants. Guard subjects like a cow, nor ask for milk for each passing hour. A vine must first be sprinkled, then it ripens fruit and flower. The monarch lamp from its subject draws tax oil to keep it bright. Has anyone ever noticed kings that shone by inner light? A seedling is a tender thing, and yet, if not neglected, it comes in time to bearing fruit, so subjects well protected. Their subjects form the only source from which accrue to kings, their gold, grain, gems, and varied drinks, and many other things. The kings who serve the common well luxuriantly sprout. The common loss is kingly loss, without a shade of doubt. After listening to this address, Numskull said, Well, gentlemen, you are quite convincing. But if an animal does not come to me every day as I sit here, I promise you, I will eat you all. To this they assented with much relief and fearlessly roamed the wood. Each day at noon one of them appeared as his dinner, each species taking its turn and providing an individual grown old or religious or grief-smitten or fearful of the loss of son or wife. One day a rabbit's turn came, it being rabbit's day, and when all the thronging animals had given him directions, he reflected, How is it possible to kill this lion? Curse him! Yet, after all, in what can wisdom not prevail? In what can resolution fail? What cannot flattery subdue? What cannot enterprise put through? I can kill anything, even a lion. So he went very slowly, planning to arrive tardily and meditating with troubled spirit on a means of killing him. Late in the day he came to the presence of the lion, whose throat was pinched by hunger in consequence of the delay, and who angrily thought as he licked his chops, Aha! I must kill all the animals first thing in the morning. While he was thinking, the rabbit slowly drew near, 
bowed low and stood before him. But when the lion saw that he was tardy and too small for a meal, his soul flamed with wrath, and he taunted the rabbit, saying, You reprobate! First you are too small for a meal, second you are tardy. Because of this wickedness I am going to kill you, and tomorrow morning I shall extirpate every species of animal. Then the rabbit bowed low and said with deference, Master, the wickedness is not mine, nor the other animals. Pray, hear the cause of it. And the lion answered, Well, make it quick before you are between my fangs. Master, said the rabbit, all the animals recognized today that the rabbit's turn had come, and because I was quite small, they dispatched me with five other rabbits. But in mid-journey, there came from a great hole in the ground a lion who said, Where are you bound? Pray to your favorite god. Then I said, We are traveling as the dinner of Lion Numskull, our master, according to agreement. Is that so, he said. This forest belongs to me, so all the animals without exception must deal with me according to agreement. This numbskull is a sneaky thief. Call him out and bring him here at once. Then whichever of us proves stronger shall be king and shall eat all these animals. At his command, master, I have come to you. This is the cause of my tardiness. For the rest, my master is the sole judge. After listening to this, Numskull said, Well, well, my good fellow, show me that sneaky thief of a lion and be quick about it. I cannot find peace of mind until I have vented on him my anger against the animals. He should have remembered the saying. Land and friends and gold at most have been won when battles cease, but if one of these should fail, do not think of breaking peace. Where no great reward is won, where defeat is nearly sure, never stir a quarrel, but find it wise to endure. Quite so, master, said the rabbit. Warriors fight for their country when they are insulted. But this fellow skulks in a fortress. You know he came out of a fortress when he held us up, and an enemy in a fortress is hard to handle, as the saying goes. A single royal fortress adds more military force than do a thousand elephants, a hundred thousand horse. A single archer from a wall, a hundredfold for fens, and so the military art a fortress recommends. God and Deer used the wit and skill of gods in days of old, when Devil Goldmap plagued the world to build a fortress hold. And he decreed that any king who built a fortress sound should conquer foremen. This is why such fortresses abound. When he heard this, Numskull said, My good fellow, show me that thief. Even if he is hiding in a fortress, I will kill him. For the proverb says, The strongest man who fails to crush at birth a disease or foe will later be destroyed by that which he permits to grow. And again, the man who reckons well his power, nor pride nor vigor lacks, may single-handed smite his foes, like Rama with the axe. Very true, said the rabbit. But after all, it was a mighty lion that I saw, so the master should not set out without realizing the enemy's capacity. As the saying runs, A warrior failing to compare two hosts in mad desire, for battle plunges like a moth, head foremost into the fire. And again, the weak who challenge mighty foes a battle to abide, like elephants with broken tusks, return with drooping pride. But Numskull said, What business is it of yours? Show him to me, even in his fortress. Very well, said the rabbit. Follow me, master. And he led the way to a well, where he said to the lion, Master, who can endure your majesty? The moment that he saw you, that thief crawled clear into this hole. Come, I will show him to you. Be quick about it, my good fellow, said Numskull. So the rabbit showed him into the well, and the lion, being a dreadful fool, saw his own reflection in the water, and gave voice to a great roar. Then from the well issued a roar twice as loud because of the echo. This the lion heard 
decided that his rival was very powerful, hurled himself down and met his death. Thereupon the rabbit cheerfully carried the glad news to all the animals, received their compliments, and lived there contentedly in the forest. And that is why I say intelligence is power, and the rest of it. But, said Cheek, that is like a palm fruit falling on a crow's head, a quite exceptional case. Even if the rabbit was successful, still a man of feeble power should not deal fraudulently with the great. And Victor retorted, Feeble or strong, one must make up his mind to vigorous action. You know the proverb. Unceasing effort brings success. Fate, fate is all. Let dastards wail. Smite fate and prove yourself a man. What fault if bold endeavor fail? Furthermore, the very gods befriend those who ever strive, as the story goes. The gods befriend a man who climbs determination's height, so Vishnu discuss, birds sustained, the weaver in the fight. And further, not even Brahma sees the end of well-devised deceit, the weaver taking Vishnu's form, embrace the princess sweet. How is that, asked Cheek? Are undertakings successful, even through deceit, resolutely and well-devised? And Victor told the story of the weaver who loved a princess. That is the end of chapter 10. Next chapter will be chapter 11. The Weaver Who Loved a Princess Well, it seems that Numskull was outsmarted by the rabbit, much in the way the dog in Aesop's fables loses his meat because he wants to fight his own reflection. The next chapter is extremely long, so I didn't add it to this one, but in the next episode we will see how a lowly weaver can capture the heart and hand of a princess. Thank you, and good night.